Arguably one of the most important reactions you'll learn in a biochemistry class is glycolysis. Glycolysis is at the heart of essentially all of metabolism, all of the chemical reactions that occur within cells. And so it's very important to understand the minutia of this process. And it's because each step along the way, we have intermediates that are very important that, we can, that can be used for various other reactions. The main context in which people typically speak about glycolysis involves uh, the generation of ATP, and that's not necessarily 100% accurate, but um, arguably the most important role of glycolysis in life is for extracting energy from glucose. And um, glycolysis itself does not generate the vast quantities of ATP that we need to survive. That actually comes later um, in the citric acid cycle. The main purpose of glycolysis is to take a glucose molecule and um, catabolize it, break it down to extract energy from the uh, high energy electron to, to store the energy, to take the energy that's stored in a glucose molecule and capture it into things that we refer to as high energy electron pairs like NADH and FADH2. And NADH and FADH2 are the two molecules that are actually used later in the citric acid cycle that give us the massive quantities of ATP we need to survive. Um, there are also several other key intermediates or products that come from glycolysis such as pyruvate. Pyruvate or pyruvic acid is incredibly important in several other metabolic pathways that our cells need to survive. So that's the reason why I'm trying to make sure that we understand that glycolysis is not just about making ATP. Um, and so with that in mind, I'd like to make this video overview talking about glycolysis. And this is by no means super in-depth, but uh, the reason I'm making this video is because I felt when I was taking biochemistry, I couldn't find someone who went into the level of detail that I needed when I was taking a class, like the enzyme name at each step and the intermediates and what needs to happen to each intermediate before we get to the final products. Um, so hopefully if you are interested in diving a little bit deeper into the minutia of glycolysis, this video will be useful. And so to start off with the general reaction that glycolysis needs to operate involves the import of a glucose molecule. You'll need two NAD plus molecules, two ADP, um, ATP molecules to begin with. And the products, the overall products we get from the whole reaction are two pyruvates, two NADH molecules, two ATP, two waters, and two protons. And one of the things that I really like about glycolysis is that it involves, it, it's so central to uh, cells metabolism that we can see where problems can arise in patients with diabetes, for example. So getting this glucose molecule into your cell is very, um, it's a highly regulated process. And what happens is you'll have glucose molecules, uh, floating around in the blood or in solution, and the cell is running low on ATP, so it goes through a series of feedback loops that say we need to run glycolysis more, so what are we going to do? We need to take glucose in from the outside and bring it into the cytosol where we can perform glycolysis to generate more ATP. And where insulin comes in is insulin is helps the hexose transporters, hexose just refers to a six carbon sugar, Hexose transporters move the uh, glucose and other sugar molecules across the cell membrane into the cytosol where we can actually perform chemical reactions on them to derive ATP and other various molecules needed for metabolism. And so in patients who uh, develop insulin uh, deficiency or their cells just stop being receptive to insulin, what happens is the, the glucose will remain outside of the cell and they'll go through, uh, they'll, they'll have high blood sugar levels after they eat a candy bar or something like that. 
and it causes lots of problems. And diabetes is a huge problem in the United States right now. So I like that example because it shows how important understanding every little step along the way of glycolysis can be uh, to have a good understanding of where we see diseases or conditions on the macro level arising from. And so to begin with, once glucose has been brought into the cell, it is a molecule that likes to uh, dissolve out pretty readily. So the first step that a cell needs to do to keep glucose in is to do something called phosphorylation. And phosphorylation is performed by enzymes, a class of enzymes referred to as kinases. Kinases is just a generic term for something that moves a phosphate group between two molecules. And so what happens is this um, hydroxy group on the uh, glucose molecule will be changed into a phosphate group that is much bulkier and um, can't make it out of the cell anymore. So once, so the very first step of glycolysis is this initial phosphorylation because it will trap the glucose inside the cell where the cells can actually perform uh, catabolism on it and break it down to get the high energy electron pairs for ATP or perform other reactions on it. So that's step one. And the enzyme that performs this is referred to as hexokinase. Hexo meaning it's working on a six carbon sugar, the kinase meaning that it moves a phosphate group onto the six carbon sugar, in this case it's glucose. And ATP is consumed in this process, so one of the three phosphate groups is transferred off, the ATP becomes an ADP, and that third, the lost AT, uh, phosphate group ends up on the glucose molecule, which is now referred to as glucose 6-phosphate. Once glucose 6-phosphate is um, created, something um, the next step is we have something called phosphoglucose isomerase. Isomers are uh, in organic chemistry, we refer to isomers as molecules that have the same chemical formula, so they still have the same number of carbons and hydrogens and oxygens and phosphates, but they have a different uh, geometry or arrangement. So the bonds are not identical. They have the same number of atoms, same types of atoms, but the bonds between these atoms are different. And so what an isomerase does is it's another class of enzyme that will change the bonding within atoms of this glucose 6-phosphate molecule. So phosphoglucose isomerase comes along and changes it into a molecule referred to as fructose 6-phosphate. Fructose, um, so this new molecule can be phosphorylated again and this is another, um, it's in preparation for splitting the molecule in half which we'll get to in two steps. So fructose 6-phosphate is another intermediate involved in the uh, second and third steps of glycolysis. It is again phosphorylated by something called phosphofructokinase, fructose kinase. Um, again, we see the kinase class of enzymes. What they're doing is they're taking this hydroxy group, converting it into a phosphate group, um, which is used later to um, convert the new molecule, which is referred to as fructose 1,6-biphosphate, into um, two separate molecules. So this fructose 1,6-biphosphate has had two phosphates attached to it, and the next step that's going to happen is an aldolase, which is another class of enzyme that's important to learn in a biochemistry class, is going to act on this molecule. And what's going to happen is the carbon three carbon four bond will be broken. And you can get into the, if you're interested in the organic chemistry behind this, you can get down to the arrow pushing mechanisms and look at how precisely this enzyme works. But the main point is we get two different molecules from it. We get glyceraldehyde three phosphate and another molecule referred to as, I would call it DHAP. And what happens is the glyceraldehyde three phosphate molecule can be um, dehydrogenated by, an, by a molecule referred to as glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase, and this is where we generate our first molecule of NADH. NADH is gold 
<laughs> it is a very nice molecule to have because these are high energy electron carriers that will be used in the TCA cycle later on that will actually get us a lot of ATP. The other molecule, however, that gets created by the fructose bisphosphate aldolase is something called DHAP. It stands for dihydroxy um, aldophosphate, I believe. And what needs to happen here is this enzyme, the dehydrogenase class of enzymes, cannot operate on uh, DHAP. So we need to isomerize this molecule into uh, glycerolhyde 3 phosphate via the enzyme referred to as triose phosphate isomerase. Again, we see the isomer class of enzymes, the isomerase class of enzymes. It's going to change this DHAP molecule into a glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate molecule that can have the second NADH extracted from the same glucose molecule. And so every step past step four, so step five and beyond, we're now working with two, one, two, three carbon molecules. So glucose is a six carbon molecule. It stayed a six carbon molecule up until the point when the aldolase cut it in half at this C3-C4 bond into two three-carbon molecules. And only the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate version of that three-carbon molecule can have NADH extracted from it, but the cell can recover the triose phosphate isomerase via, tri uh, via this enzyme and get the other uh, NADH from it. So it's a way of maximizing the efficiency, maximizing the amount of energy that the cell can capture from a single glucose molecule. An important enzyme that uh, you see again and again, uh, you'll probably encounter on a test, is referred to as phosphofructokinase 1. And this is an important enzyme in regulating all of glycolysis. It is activated by ATP, or the lack thereof. And so, it is referred to as the gatekeeper of glycolysis by many biologists and chemists because when ATP levels fall, that means that the cell is running low on ATP. When phosphofructokinase does not have an ATP bound to it, it will become more active. And so why is this important? It's important because if ATP is low, we want to run more of glycolysis to generate more ATP. Specifically, we want to run more glycolysis to create more pyruvate so that we can run more TCA cycle to get more ATP, but this is one of the steps along the way in that metabolic pathway to get there. So phosphofructokinase is an incredibly important enzyme in regulating glycolysis and ATP production. So it works via a negative feedback loop. So if you have a lot of ATP, it's very likely that an ATP molecule will be bound to PFK1, and if PFK1 has an ATP bound to it, it won't perform step three, and none of glycolysis will happen because there's no need for it because you already have a lot of ATP present in the cell. So it's a very good feedback loop to have in your body so you don't waste all of your glucose uh, immediately when you don't need it, when you already have all the ATP you need to uh, be active at a proper level. So very important enzyme to remember here. Um, going on to the next step. So this first, these first few steps are referred to as the investment phase. It's referred to as the investment phase because we've given up two molecules of ATP to trap the glucose in the molecule and break it into a three carbon sugar, or two three carbon molecules. And so far, all we've gotten from it is an NADH molecule, which is very useful later on, but so far we haven't netted any ATP from our reaction. So the next step that's going to happen is referred to, this next sequence of steps, the second half of the reaction, is referred to as the payoff phase. And so in the payoff phase, what's going to happen is the, um, so once the NADH was extracted from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, the molecule is now referred to as simply glyceraldehyde phosphate and it will be dehydrogenated via a dehydrogenase enzyme to extract a second molecule of NADH from it. This second molecule of NADH um, 
will be used again in uh, the citric acid cycle, which will allow us to generate more ATP. I do believe this. So um, moving on. So this after this step, we now enter our payoff phase. And so in the payoff phase, we will now generate an ATP from one of the phosphate groups that we added onto our molecule. So I made a mistake a few seconds ago. This triose phosphate isomerase, um, so this molecule, glycerolide-3-phosphate, once it has NADH extracted from it, now is referred to as 1,3-BPG, 1,3-bisphospho, um, uh, something. <laughs> um, so what's going to happen here is, note again, that this is a 1,2,3 carbon molecule. This 3-carbon molecule will have its ATP one of its ATP molecules extracted from it. And once that happens, um, the next step is to, so we are going to use another kinase to extract the ATP molecule from this. Important to note that now we are dealing with two three carbon molecules because this one six carbon glucose became three carbon, two three carbon molecules. We can extract ATP from that. And afterwards, uh, we are able to use something referred to as uh, PGA mutase to switch, perform essentially an isomerization, or, or it moves. So mutase is another class of enzymes that move functional groups around on the same biomolecule. And once we do that, we now have something referred to as PGA2. And these are all, the, the purpose of the um, payoff phase in general is to extract ATP, a little partially, but mostly it's to generate pyruvate, which is the main molecule that we will feed into uh, the citric acid cycle later on. And so PGA2 will again um, be chemically transformed via an enzyme referred to as enolase. And enolase, if you recall from organic chemistry, an enol is the name of a carbon-carbon um, double bond that has a hydroxy group, an alcohol functional group, attached to one of the sp2 hybridized carbons. Enols are not stable molecules. They perform things referred to as ketol enol tautomerizations, which I'll get to in two steps. But the main point is once the hydroxy group has been moved into the terminal position, enolase can act on it to remove this hydroxy group. And these electrons between this terminal carbon and the hydroxy group will then be transformed into forming a pi bond. And this pi bond is what forms the enol, hence the, the enzyme's name enolase. And the next step is to extract another ATP from this molecule. So ADP will come along and it will grab and break this oxygen phosphate bond to forming an ATP molecule in the process. Um, the enzyme that refer that does this is referred to as pyruvate kinase. And this is another key enzyme to remember. Pyruvate kinase, we're generating pyruvate from it, and we are also taking an ATP molecule, a phosphate, off the molecule, hence the name kinase. And so in summary, um, we invested two ATP initially during our investment phase and we got two three carbon molecules. From each of those two three carbon molecules, we extracted two ATP from it. So we are, so we just gained four ATP, we invested two ATP, so our net gain of ATP is two ATP from this one 
molecule of glucose. So it's pretty common you'll be asked what the overall reaction or overall yeah, stoichiometry of glycolysis is. You gain two ATP from this reaction, which is a decent amount, but it's not the end-all be-all. We can extract a lot more if we go to the citric acid cycle, which is the whole purpose of generating pyruvate, NADH, and FADH2. And one of the things that I would like to also discuss is the reason why it's important to Let me see. Then I'll it's probably best to talk that out about that in another video. But um, yeah, I hope this is a good introduction into the steps of glycolysis. Hopefully, you guys find it useful. Thank you for watching, and let me know if you have any questions or if I made any mistakes. Uh, thank you, and goodbye.